Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin and welcome uh, to our Friday morning educational session here. Um, and it's uh, really a pleasure uh, for me to introduce our, um, uh, our presenter and discussant. Um, as has been the case over the uh, past two years, we've had the great fortune of having um, folks present uh, from all parts of the world, even though it may be uh, very challenging from a time perspective. Uh, this morning is no, is no different here. Um, we have the pleasure of, in, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Whitney Liddy, who is an assistant professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Liddy uh, completed her fellowship training in thyroid and parathyroid surgery in Boston with Dr. Greg Randolph. After finishing her otolaryngology training um, in residency at Northwestern uh, back in 2015. And uh, Dr. Ha Alan Ho, who is joining us from the West Coast, um, is professor of surgery at Cedar sinai where he is the director of the head and neck cancer program, as well as co-director of the thyroid cancer program. Dr. Ho's research um, focuses in thyroid cancer risk stratification, cancer proteonomics, and HPV positive or pharyngeal cancer. He has published extensively, including co-editing a textbook entitled Multidisciplinary Care of the Head and Neck Cancer Patient. Um, uh, Dr. Ho has particular focus on recurrent laryngeal nerve preservation techniques, which is um, obviously the topic of this morning's journal club session. Um, and so we'll look forward to his discussion after um, Dr. Liddy uh, presents the paper that was distributed. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna turn over the program, but ask that all of you um, send in your questions as always, and we will do our best to get to those uh, before the nine o'clock hour here in New York. And so with that, I welcome Dr. Uh, Liddy and thank you very much for, um, uh, for jo joining us. Thanks so much, Dr. Erkin. I'm happy to be here. Let me just share my screen. Okay, everybody can see my screen hopefully. make sure it's working. There we go. All right, so thanks again, um, everybody, for having me join today. Um, I'm going to talk about and highlight our recent study published in Thyroid that took an in-depth look at the surgical anatomy of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, including variations of neural anatomy and potential correlations with recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and vocal cord paralysis. Uh, based on the clear minimalism you, you see here that we employed to create our brief title and this short list of authors. I'm sure you, you may not believe me when I say I'll try to focus on the highlights here, but I'll do my best. I don't have any disclosures. So to start, I'd like to just uh, show a few intro slides to address the question of why should I care about this topic or why should I bother reading by, beyond your 46 word title? I uh, remember Dr. Leahy and Dr. Hoover in Boston and Dr. Riddell in London have been credited with the realization that visualizing the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve during thyroidectomy helps prevent nerve injury. This is the gold standard. Although it's not foolproof, we know a visually intact nerve at the end of the case isn't equivalent to a post-operatively functioning nerve. Why do we care about uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury? We know it can cause temporary or permanent vocal cord paralysis, which can cause morbidity for the patient in terms of voice outcomes, uh, aspiration risk, dysphagia. But patients don't always complain of hoarseness when they come back to you to see you postoperatively after thyroidectomy. With studies showing a good percentage of these patients with nerve injury uh, who don't complain of voice problems at their postoperative visit. The potential for morbidity remains, however, highlighted by some studies that have showed higher rates of things like lower respiratory tract infection and rehospitalization, and otherwise low risk, low morbidity patients who underwent thyroidectomy. We published a consensus statement from the American End Neck Society back in 2020 on immediate and partial neural dysfunction after thyroid and parathyroid surgery, which really served to help highlight the under-recognized but important potential morbidity 
associated with unilateral vocal paralysis, or also milder partial laryngeal dysfunction in the immediate postoperative period. This helped to further highlight the need for a lower threshold for postoperative laryngeal evaluation for patients and really recognize the benefits of early treatment for these patients. This doesn't even touch on the potential medical legal impact from oral and injuries, right, which remain the leading cause of litigation uh, after thyroidectomy. Historical reliance on that single patient complaint of hoarseness post-op as the only means for detecting a nerve injury not only misses those patients who display different or more subtle symptoms, but it also clearly misses those significant numbers of patients who are asymptomatic. It's not surprising in this setting that the true incidence of nerve injury really is unknown and likely significantly underreported. I really love this graph. This is from the um, 2012 British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeons audit. Um, it shows that as the percentage of postoperative laryngeal exams increases, so too does the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury rate. So here uh, in this graph, they're looking at the rates on the y-axis of postoperative laryngoscopy. And you can see these surgeons up here that are above 80%. So they look at the larynx after surgery more than 80% and more than 80% of patients. What you can see is their nerve injury rate here is over double those surgeons who only look um, less than 30% of the time. So with the risk of nerve injury in mind, many studies have investigated recurrent laryngeal nerve anatomic variations, such as altered neural trajectory out of kind of the expected path of the nerve, um, differences in the caliber of the nerve, thin nerves, extra laryngeal branching patterns of the nerve. And then um, they've also looked at potential relationships of the nerve with various landmarks like the ligament berry, the tracheoesophageal groove, the inferior thyroid artery. Other more dynamic intraoperative characteristics surrounding the nerve have been discussed, such as the extent of neural dissection as a possible risk factor for nerve injury. And then intraoperative nerve monitoring has played an important adjunctive role to direct visualization for a better understanding of these anatomical variations in relation to electrophysiologic neural function and risk of nerve injury. So this is where our study comes into play. This was a large international registry database study with prospectively collected data conducted through the International Neural Monitoring Study Group, which included data entries from 17 centers across the world, totaling 1,000 recurrent laryngeal nerves at risk from 574 patients. This database is ongoing, and we're working on the next study with 5,000 nerves at risk, but I'll share some of what we've found so far. So the main study objectives were to better understand detailed surgical Arlen anatomy and potential anatomic variability, to establish potential correlates between Arlen anatomic variations and electrophysiologic responses, and with that loss of EMG signal signifying nerve injury, and then use of this information to help potentially minimize postoperative morbidity and really refine our use of intraoperative nerve monitoring. So this is the first large international multicenter database study, again, with prospectively collected data, really looking at the roles of Arlen anatomy, intraoperative electrophysiologic data, and then postoperative outcomes. Data was collected via electronic submission to an online data repository that was developed and, and managed by Dr. Jennifer Shin out of Boston. And then inclusion criteria here were really all monitored thyroid surgeries following standardized procedures according to previously published uh, neural monitoring study group guidelines. Exclusion criteria included bulky lymphadenopathy that was thought to, to possibly independently alter RLN trajectories as well as nerve monitoring failure and then failure to identify visually um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So data submitted included demographic data. Um, and in order to help standardize data reporting, we relied on a prior characterized classification scheme for oral and anatomy, which we'll look at in a minute, as well as nerve monitoring study group guidelines and previously published for nerve monitoring and thyroid surgery. Reporting for nerve monitoring included um, preoperative laryngoscopy, or L1, we included pre-dissection vagal and recurrent laryngeal nerve EMG data, including amplitudes and latencies of the nerves, and then post-dissection 
EMG data for both nerves, followed by that post-operative laryngoscopy within two months of surgery. We also collected data on loss of EMG signal uh, in cases of nerve injury, as well as the type and mechanism of neural injury and functional outcomes. So this is the International RLN Anatomic Classification System. It was created back in 2015 by members of the Neural Monitoring Study Group, including Dr. Greg Randolph, Dr. Che Wee Wu out of Taiwan to help surgeons better characterize and conceptualize surgical RLN anatomic variations. So this is a pictorial representation of various trajectories that the RLN can take in relation to the thyroid and the tracheoesophageal roof. So if you look here on the left, position one for the left nerve and the right nerve, shows that left nerve running through the tracheoesophageal groove, as well as that expected more oblique course of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. A position 2A is lateral displacement of that left nerve out of the tracheoesophageal groove from thyroid disease, and medial displacement of that right nerve by thyroid disease. 2B positioning is ventral displacement, from something like a, a thyroid goiter or posterior nodular development. And then the third position, L3 and R3, really gets at that embryologic non-recurrent variant. Okay, so this is the entire classification system. I know it's hard to read in table format, um, but what I want to point out is that included in this system, and we'll go through this table, is an estimated prevalence um, for each of these trajectories you could see at the top and some of these other important anatomic neural features that were listed in the classification scheme. So if we break it down, you can see that trajectory data here. Um, and you can see that the estimated prevalence for obviously for the nor normal trajectories is much higher than for these abnormal variants. And then if we look at the second portion of the table, this is a list of those anatomical details of the recurrent laryngeal nerve thought to be potentially clinically relevant, okay? So including things like a nerve that's fixed or splayed or entrapped along the thyroid capsule, due to goiterous change, for example, invaded nerves by cancer, right? nerves that are entrapped at that posterior ligament of Berry or associated vessels running through that ligament, branch nerves, nerves that show different extralaryngeal um, branching patterns, and then nerves with thin calibers, so less than one millimeter in diameter. And then finally, Dynamic intraoperative features of the nerve were categorized, including neural injury with loss of signal, which was broken down into uh, focal or pinpoint type one injuries where you could stimulate along the nerve and then you see exactly where you lose signal, or a global type two injury where you can stimulate all along the RLN to the vagus and you still can't figure out where the site of injury is, okay. The classification scheme also includes the extent of neural dissection as a dynamic intraoperative characteristic of the RLN thought to potentially affect um, nerve outcomes. Okay, so let's look at some of the main results of the study. Here's a summary of patient demographic data showing, uh, you know, average age, almost 50, um, more women here than men included in the study. Patients were from all over the world, but mainly in Asia, Europe, and North America. Most patients underwent total thyroidectomy. We did include patients that also underwent um, central node dissection or lateral node dissection during their, their thyroid surgery. And then um, we included patients with both benign and malignant disease. And we also included um, rates of postoperative complications, which were small and similar to those seen in the literature. You can see here that 4.5% uh, of patients were affected by a vocal cord paresis or paralysis. This graph just shows our uh, mean EMG data for both pre-dissection um, values for the vagus and RLN, as well as post-dissection values for the vagus and RLN, both on the right side and the left side. Um, and these were consistent with reports in the literature um, for both sides. This next slide is, I, I know, pretty busy, but what we essentially did was we evaluated um, 
our prevalence data from the SAR study and compared this to es the estimated um, overall prevalence data from the literature. And we looked at this data for both the entire study population, a thousand nerves, um, as well as uh, the group of patients here on the right with a nerve injury or loss of signal. And some interesting things we found were that more nerves than we expected followed an abnormal trajectory. Uh, with 23% of all study nerves showing an abnormal trajectory, and then an even higher number of loss of signal nerves showing a varied course. We also saw an increased percentage of nerves that were fixed okay, to the thyroid capsule at 30% of nerves, and this, this increased to 50% of nerves in the case of substernal goiter. And then we did have 35 recurrent laryngeal nerves with a loss of signal. More commonly on the right side, is the right column. And then most injuries were those focal type one injuries where you could pinpoint exactly where the loss of signal occurred. And finally, we did find that extensive neural dissection um, was more common, much more common in that loss of signal group compared to the overall study population. Our overall rate of neural injury was 3.5% of all nerves at risk, and this was 4.5% of patients. Our um, nerve injury was defined as a loss of signal with amplitude of the recurrent laryngeal nerve decreasing to below 100 microvolts when the initial amplitude was at least 500 microvolts. The overall rate of vocal cord paresis or paralysis was 2.6%. And then when you look at loss of signal with nerve monitoring as a test of postoperative vocal cord paralysis or paresis, you can see that that negative predictive value or lack of a loss of signal with nerve monitoring was pretty good at predicting normal vocal fold mobility. And then again, here, I just, I just highlight again that most injuries were these focal injuries where you could pinpoint where the injury occurred. So this is a flow chart that depicts um, all of the, the study patients, and then those patients who had a loss of signal during surgery. Of those patients, 26 patients um, had a vocal cord paralysis or paresis, and then 10 of those patients were symptomatic. So only about 38% of these vocal cord paresis and paralysis cases um, were symptomatic, at least judged by the surgeon um, entering the data. And then most of the symptomatic patients did recover by 12 months. Um, interesting that many of the asymptomatic patients did not show any neural recovery by that 12-month period. This table looks at mechanism of nerve injury, which was evaluated in relation to postoperative vocal cord function and patient symptoms. And this categorized injuries listed here in the left column. Uh, including traction injuries, okay, the traction of the nerve at the ligament of Berry versus traction along a goiterous adhesion or along the thyroid capsule. Mild or moderate mechanical trauma like suction or clamping injuries, okay, down here. Constriction injuries from like a ligature or a clip, and then thermal injuries and transection injuries. Most injuries, which is consistent with the literature, were traction injuries. Most of them occurred at the ligament of Berry region, which you know, we, we know from prior literature, that's the, has been the known highest risk area for injury of the nerve. There were no transections or constriction injuries. And then our few mechanical and thermal injuries that we saw were focal with the vocal cord paresis or paralysis recovering by 12 months. The last table here, highlights the results of our multivariate analysis, showing statistically significant anatomical risk factors for both loss of signal, as well as vocal cord paresis or paralysis. Major themes to note are the associated increased risk of injury with a nerve invaded by cancer, that's not surprising, um, as well as an unexpected or abnormal neural trajectory, as well as a nerve fixation to the thyroid or entrapment at the ligament of Berry extensive dissection and increased exposure of the RLN, as well as uh, lateral lymph node dissection, which may confer you know, possibly the higher degree of disease, were also associated with increased risk of nerve injury. <laughs>
So if we think about all this data and try to summarize some of the key findings that we found and points of interest, um, I would say a couple of things. First, a higher number of these nerves than expected showed a very coarse or abnormal uh, neural trajectory. One in four nerves from the overall study population really showed that very coarse. Almost a third of nerves were fixed to the thyroid capsule, rising to 50% with substernal goiter. And then 40% of all nerves um, overall were entrapped at the ligament of Berry. And all of these uh, anatomic variations were found by meta-analysis in the study to increase the risk of neural injury. More extensive surgery, greater extent of RLN dissection also increased the risk of nerve injury. In agreement with the literature, our nerve injuries were mostly traction injuries at the ligament of Berry number one and at the thyroid capsule number two. And then greater than 80% of these injuries resulted in vocal cord paresis or paralysis with 40 to 45% of these being symptomatic. Nerve mapping with neural monitoring was helpful for prognostication as well as for the mapping of neural trajectories and delineation of neural injuries. And then post-op laryngeal exam is important as a means to more accurately predict post-operative neural outcomes. And it also allows for the identification of asymptomatic vocal cord paresis or paralysis or those minimally symptomatic patients who may benefit from earlier post-operative interventions. And finally, with that, we are working on the next study. So the database is still open and um, surgeons from all over the world are still submitting their data for cases. Um, so the next study will look at 5,000 nerves at risk. And with that, I uh, will end, um, but thanks so much for having me here. All right, I think I'm next. Um, uh, that was a terrific uh, talk, Lydia, of a terrific paper. Um, for all the people in the audience, I was talking to Dr. Liddy earlier, the present, the paper seemed like uh, a very rigorous exercise in herding cats. Um, and looking at the authors on the paper, they were pretty big cats. <laughs> um, and so hopefully I'll be able to um, provide some context, discuss um, the um, the, the, the reason why we um, uh, are um, this such a focused structure can cause so much uh, consternation and anxiety um, when it comes to um, a surgery that should be, you know, beautiful and um, elegant in its simplicity. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, as uh, we sometimes find, the more you, you um, the seek, the more you find. I have no um, financial disclosures uh, to present. I have nothing to disclose. Um, and again, thank you for the privilege, uh, Dr. Erkin, of uh, letting us um, uh, 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 have a healthy dialogue about uh, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, I'll spend just a minute um, uh, re uh, rehashing um, Dr. Liddy's study and why I found it important. Um, I think this is something that many um, thyroid surgeons and endocrine surgeons um, have in the back of their mind, but really hasn't been articulated or enunciated um, to such a, um, a rigorous degree. Um, I think some of the things that um, I was very impressed with uh, were that, again, uh, so many um, authors were able to be uh, corralled into um, uh, uh, contributing to the study in an international uh, scope. Uh, so hats off to Dr. Randolph uh, as well for his um, singular determination uh, to have um, such a study be uh, conducted. Um, I think it was um, very disciplined uh, and very detailed in how it included intraoperative electrophysiologic responses. Um, and then the, um, la uh, the, the long-term follow-up, I think also, again, very um, helpful uh, rather than um, to um, state the percentage of uh, paralysis, but then not necessarily have long-term functional outcomes. Um, I think um, as we become more and more experienced and uh, detailed with regards to uh, the course of the nerve, um, the, um, the detail which this paper discussed, uh, the fixed, splayed, and entrapped um, uh, substratification is also very helpful, um, both from a research point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, um, so that, uh, you know, the nerves uh, for us right in that area, I think, um, are so important because um, as uh, everybody knows who does thyroid surgery, it can be uh, 
um, very, very uh, uh, stress free and relaxed. And there's always those couple minutes when you're uh, right at the Barry's ligament where you're, you're probably thinking in the back of your head, you know, what's this nerve going to give me, right? And Wendy, I think everybody understands and uh, this paper has really articulated it so well. The reason it's important and for the endocrinologists and other clinicians in the room is because the surgeons really need to strive for this balance. And I've struggled with this balance as well. On the one hand, we um, have to balance nerve preservation. On the other hand, um, in order to get to that nerve, we have to do some kind of traction. Usually, you know, I stand on the opposite side of the thyroid and you want to um, pull back just enough um, uh, to uh, find the nerve, but not enough to, to, to paralyze it. This is something I find very hard to teach to trainees, <laughs> uh, much less to trust them uh, in this area. And then the ultimate thing as oncologic surgeons, um, as head neck surgeons, you know, we are oftentimes um, uh, uh, based on our, our lineage and based on our training, um, especially for head neck squamous cell carcinoma, we want to get as much tissue as we can. So safe tissue removal is a priority. Yet on the other hand, it's rare that there's cancer at this Barry's ligament, right? The cancer is oftentimes way out in the parenchyma, on the lobe, on the wing, not on this area. But the final balance is that of the endocrinologist, right? If you leave too much tissue behind, the thyroid globulin will be higher. Um, you'll be you'll be scolded, and your hand might be slapped. Uh, and they, a patient might have consequences and they may need to have uh, a remnant ablation dose of REI. And so those, all those things come into play. And that's why this paper, I think, um, is very, very helpful. It, it, even uh, this table, I thought to be delightful with how um, the, uh, the odds ratio really um, quantifies um, what to expect when you have loss of signal, uh, depending on uh, what, uh, what uh, structure you see. Um, as uh, Whitney had uh, uh, echoed before, um, the clinical meaning for this um, is pretty significant. Um, I really like this paper from University of Chicago, uh, the North American Thyroid Cancer Survivorship Study. I think Greg Rogan is one of the senior authors, um, looked at how there is just a major um, disconnect between patient and physician. Um, and it's startling. Um, if you look at this, um, uh, oh, uh, this table, you'll see that what we quote to patients and what patients actually say happens afterwards is, is um, there, there's a major divide. Uh, in this case, that first uh, line, a change in everyday speaking voice or in your, in your singing voice, um, it's a factor um, of 54% to 5%. Um, hypocalcemia, where you actually have to take medications. We oftentimes will quote patients like, ah, it's no big deal. It's about 1% or uh, less uh, incidence, but you know, about a third of patients will have hypocalcemia type symptoms requiring medication. So um, I think um, the more we understand about um, the nerve, um, uh, the more we uh, realize that uh, the nerve can be very delicate, it can be fragile, it can be fickle, um, and that it's a spectrum. It's not just the nerve works or it doesn't. Um, and this loss of signal is just part of the story, um, the electrophysiologic um, spectrum. And also if you have continuous nerve monitoring uh, can perhaps predict um, that change in a way that may be hard to quantify and hard to, hard to, hard to pin down. Um, so as such, it's important to avoid those adverse sequelae by uh, following the nerve uh, and understanding the normal nerve trajectory. Um, it's important to identify it. It's important for central neck dissection, especially if you have a healthy um, uh, proportion of cancer patients in your practice. Uh, and as I was uh, alluding to earlier, it's oftentimes the most critical portion of the procedure. Another thing, and this is perhaps um, thyroid surgeons being uh, philosophical again, is that the stakes are paradoxically higher when it's low, when it's low risk cancer or when it's not cancer at all. Um, something about our gut really um, strikes home when it's a benign nodule and you get loss of signal, right? So the, the even more important paradoxically for the non-cancer type uh, patients because of um, uh, uh, how uh, we expect even a higher rate of success for something that's not necessarily life-threatening. Um, this is a nice uh, photo uh, or illustration by Tofano and Sarah Pai uh, that illustrates, at least for me, um, the extent of uh, nerve dissec uh, node dissection for um, central neck dissection, and again, how the trajectory can play a big role. On the right side, um, if the nerve uh, goes about at about a 30 per, uh, degree angle, um, you do um, typically need to find some nodes deep uh, to the nerve itself. And so you sometimes have to transpose the nerve or move it in order to get those nodes out. Whereas on the left side, um, the nerve tends to hug the tracheoesophageal groove in a vertical orientation. So usually since it's hugging, there's really not lymph nodes deep to it. 
this nerve, I think, usually is a little bit easier, <clears throat> excuse me, easier to um, uh, follow and not have to move around as much. Um, so there's less need for nerve transposition. Um, one thing that I found um, fascinating about the nerve is that in some ways it's not that surprising that it tends to branch. Um, if you follow the nerve um, uh, uh, distally enough, uh, especially once it gets underneath the cricopharyngeus muscle, it inevitably will tend to branch. This is a nice illustration uh, in Dr. Randall's textbook um, showing that there are sensory, there are motor branches, um, there are branches that um, hit different muscles. Um, uh, and as such, if it uh, starts to branch outside of the muscle, you know, perhaps it's not necessarily that surprising. Um, there are many studies actually out there, um, cadaver studies and otherwise, that show just how um, beautiful and how diverse uh, the nerve variation can be. Um, and interestingly, this paper out of uh, Beaumont University shows that it's a striking minority of the time where it doesn't branch. Um, I found it very surprising that only about 10% of cases don't branch at all, and a, a large minority, 40% of the time, it does bifurcate. Um, and then a healthy percent of the time it trifurcates or branches even more. Um, I think, again, this just speaks to the diversity of the nerve itself and how every patient is unique and you should be surprised, uh, shouldn't be, shouldn't plan to be surprised uh, um, uh, in any given case if something looks a little unusual. Uh, they also um, uh, did a nice job of examining um, the course relative to the inferior thyroid artery, which is an important landmark. Uh, Two thirds of the time it, it ranks or travels, uh, traverses posteriorly, and about a third of the time, it traverses uh, anteriorly. Um, for um, head and neck surgeons, I think, again, this is something that is not that um, surprising because it parallels other areas in surgery. I think this is, um, uh, 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 it speaks to why I think ENTs in particular are very well suited for thyroid surgery because we deal with nerves uh, on a near constant basis. Um, if we look at other disciplines such as parotid surgery, uh, there are, uh, just like the nerve, uh, for the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, numerous classification systems. In this case, um, they uh, find that there's no clear majority and the most common kind only has about a 28% incidence. Um, you know, when I do this kind of surgery, you know, it's, it, it strikes me as some ways very similar and some ways very different. Um, the nerve caliber is very similar. The stakes are very similar instead of the voice. We're dealing with the face. Um, but I also think parotid surgery is different in that more likely than not, that tumor is going to be abutting or kissing uh, the nerve. It's almost always very, very close. There's not a lot of room up there in the parotid region. Um, uh, but then again, to bring it back to similarities, I think the nerve monitor is arguably just as important, just as arguably uh, considered standard of care as it is uh, for uh, thyroidectomy. And I think this is something that an advantage that ENTs have in their training um, that other disciplines don't. Um, we, uh, from a very early stage, um, uh, learn to be very careful and delicate uh, with structures that have real, real, real consequences. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this because it looks like uh, Whitney has already um, expanded upon um, this um, very important classification system. Um, I'm just going to zoom in and discuss, uh, as uh, Whitney did, that um, the incidence of it being um, uh, clinically important, uh, whether it be fixed blade or entrapped, invaded, or branched um, is um, not that uh, common, but it can be sufficient enough that we have to be careful about it. Um, I really like the last one, uh, the thin caliber nerve. You, we always have this um, uh, sense of um, dread, especially as we start on our practices that, you know, some nerves are too small and beyond the limit or the threshold of which human hands can dissect. Um, we, <laughs> we don't really see that that often, but it's, it's important and nice to know that this classification system recognizes that, that some nerves are just way too small uh, uh, for us to uh, get off properly. So I, I think that's it's a very um, thoughtful classification system. Um, this is a nice uh, 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 sort of landscape uh, graph of how nerve monitoring has sort of come to the fore uh, in the 90s and 2000s. Um, it probably was really not used at all. This is a study out of Poland. And then probably in the mid 2000s, Right around here, you start to see guidelines that said, well, maybe it's important for recurrent revision cases or salvage cases, but not necessary for de novo cases. And now I think, at least uh, in my generation, um, it's used for pretty much every case. You could argue to use it even for parathyroid surgeries. Um, it's, you know, there, it is an expense, um, but as I've been trained, um, the more you use it, the more you learn about it. And if you learn to troubleshoot it um, uh, on a general setting, uh, it'll, it'll help and help bail you out in those really uh, tough 
a, a rare situation. So I think um, as, a, as such, it seems like nerve monitoring is here to stay. Um, I really like nerve monitoring, um, uh, not as a crutch, but as a, as a tool. Um, I think it really helps reduce the incidence of nerve paralysis. It can really help with intraoperative diagnosis of nerve injury. Um, it helps with early nerve identification and aids in nerve dissection. Um, there is also uh, the idea that it can serve as an indirect tool. Uh, when you don't see that nerve, uh, you can sense it, um, usually with a high milli uh, 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 ampage, and then it can help you find it. I think everybody uh, has an indirect sigh of relief when they find it. The nerve, uh, the nerve once it's dissected free, um, the, the, the uh, procedure just goes along a lot more efficiently. Um, and so I think that's where the nerve can be really um, uh, uh, of a very help, helpful uh, to use. Another one, and this is a picture out of Dr. Randolph's um, textbook as well, is there are definitely times, um, especially with goiters, where the nerve is way distorted, right? You can't really find it in its normal location. Um, that's, again, um, why the surgeons um, always are a little bit more OCD when it comes to these more uh, uh, expanded cases. And I think in this particular case, for instance, having the nerve monitor is uh, healthy and helps um, find something that otherwise wouldn't may, may never have been discovered until it was too late. Um, so I think what um, we tell our trainees is nerve monitoring is helpful because, uh, and it's rational to use because it's not always uh, helpful. Many times it may be overkill, um, but you can't predict which cases um, are not gonna be overkill and which ones are gonna be very important. Um, and so um, these uh, illustrations by uh, Dianogi and Dr. Randolph uh, really demonstrate that um, having it handy um, is, is very important, especially for something that's so critical in function. I want to spend just a minute uh, talking about um, my own headaches with the nerve monitoring system, and maybe Whitney or Dr. Randolph or anyone can um, uh, at least empathize or, uh, or, uh, or cry with me when I see this. I find that one of the biggest problems with the NIM tube, and I just keep scratching my head about this whenever I talk to the manufacturer, is there's no real-time system to test whether the nerve monitor is working. On the left, uh, photo is what you would normally see. It looks like it's humming along. It looks like it's working great. But let's say the nerve doesn't work. And it's because you can't really tell if the NIM tube has lost contact with the vocal cord. You've shifted the head. The tube's been uh, shifted out of position. Only if you do an electro check will you find that the uh, vocalis nerve, maybe one of the sides, is no longer touching. Uh, but there'll also be a big fat yellow warning sign that says the monitoring is disabled. So you, you can't apparently have both. You can either assess for NIM tube contact or you can actually be running the monitor. You can't have both. And I find that to be a real head scratcher. I, I feel like if something loses contact, it should, there should be a warning system um, without you having to check it manually. Um, something I picked up in my fellowship training is we use a sterile drape um, so we can see the ET tube. The anesthesiologists like it and they hate it. They like it because they can see the anesthesia tube. They don't like it because um, it allows us as surgeons um, to actually rotate and push the tube deeper and manipulate the tube without, without their help. And so I think, <laughs> I think the, the, the anesthesiologists don't, are a little nervous, but it really helps us more quickly help troubleshoot um, in case that, nerve, that NIM tube has fallen off of the, uh, of the vocal cords and is not as functional. The other thing, if you look at the, at the, um, uh, the uh, manufacturer uh, user manual, and they talk about when things don't, aren't working, a lot of it boils down to uh, shorted fuse. Um, they can't really explain all of the reasons, but they know that the box oftentimes will, will short. Uh, we find this out when you, you know, we change all the, the probes and we change the different wires, we unplug and restart the machine, it doesn't help. And then one, uh, one new um, rep came one day and he said, you know, a lot of the times, you know, maybe it's because the cautery touched the probe and the box is, uh, it gets fused out. And it turns out if you look in the back of the box, they actually have backup fuse, fuse um, uh, replacements that um, your central supply will, will make use of. So <laughs> it sounds like this is a known problem. Um, something I've just discovered in the last couple of years that they are prepared. This is a, a known uh, issue. It's not just your institution. It's not just you. <laughs> All of this uh, is in existence. Now, um, continuous intraoperative nerve monitoring is a, another alternative. I think it helps with real-time um, uh, 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 following of the nerve uh, that intermittent cannot uh, uh, apply for. Um, the positioning of the APS electrode here is illustrated on the vagus nerve. Um, it hasn't um, reached widespread um, use. I think it's very useful in uh, select cases. I think just because it's an extra step um, and uh, uh, also you have to dig out the vagus nerve, which isn't, uh, again, difficult, but again, it's an extra step that some people may find uh, arduous. Um, I think that there are different strengths and weaknesses 
Uh, and it's something that uh, Dr. Sinclair at Mount Sinai, myself and Dr. Randolph amongst others um, were uh, happy to contribute to was uh, uh, sort of defining um, how they are complementary to each other. On the one hand, um, intermittent nerve monitoring helps with diagnosis, classification, and prevention of nerve injury um, through early nerve identification. I think it's a lot more intuitive and natural for people, uh, most surgeons to use, but continuous nerve monitoring also has significant advantages. Mainly my complaint about real-time continuous feedback. Um, and I think it is very helpful uh, for also uh, predicting um, uh, if a nerve is about to go out, uh, and, uh, and, and as such, it helps with prevention of slowly evolving nerve injury. Uh, but its main limitation is using it uh, in and of itself cannot assist in nerve localization, which is what I think is the first priority for most, most surgeons. Um, but I think um, this um, uh, uh, paper that Catherine uh, put together uh, really nicely demonstrates um, the uses uh, for nerve monitoring, if not for research or study purposes, but for clinical practice. One thing I found as I was preparing for this uh, talk is um, whether or not nerve monitoring really matters. Um, I think um, these days uh, people consider it no longer ethically rational to design trials where you don't use nerve monitoring, but there actually are many, many papers of similar ilk uh, and caliber and um, a scale as uh, Whitney's paper uh, that actually shows that nerve monitoring um, uh, is helpful. Now, um, as anyone in biostats knows, um, you can always find a statistically significant difference uh, if you have a big enough uh, uh, population study. Whether it's clinically meaningful is a different story, but if you're looking for a 0.1% difference, you can find it if you have you know, 3 trillion patients. Um, but uh, what I think is very helpful about these papers uh, is that uh, it really finds that sweet spot of um, uh, finding, you know, although these differences don't seem that much, they have enough cases to actually identify them as, as substantial. Uh, this is a paper, I think, out of Poland, where they looked at a thousand nerves for nerve monitoring and not. And if you look at the temporary nerve paralysis with nerve monitoring in blue, um, it pretty much cuts the, the, the risk of temporary nerve paralysis in half from 3.8 to 1.9. Um, and this is where um, it probably fell off uh, and you probably would need a lot more patients, but they weren't able to find a difference uh, in permanent nerve paralysis. Uh, but it goes to show you that uh, even the temporary nerve paralyses, um, uh, I think are a big uh, headache for patients and as well as for uh, surgeons. So this uh, is one of the first studies showing that nerve monitoring makes a difference. Now, um, eventually uh, you'll find a paper in this one out of Germany uh, with benign goiter patients shows that if you have enough patients, you will be able to find um, a difference. And this one does um, for permanent vocal cord paralysis. Uh, this time, uh, the temporary paralysis rate drops from 2.1 to 1.4% if you use nerve monitoring. Uh, and then for permanent paralysis, the rate gets cut in half from 0.8 to 0.4. Um, I think, um, you know, some people may argue that that's not a clinically meaningful um, difference, but, you know, I think I would argue, and maybe Whitney and others would argue that um, for uh, individual patients, um, it is uh, substantially important, um, you know, for the handful of patients that don't recover, um, their, their, their nerve, um, and those 55% of patients that say there's some change in their voice, um, I think nerve monitoring may um, help pre prevent um, more serious injury or more functional consequence. Um, I like this study out of Turkey, which looked at um, nerves in terms of uh, how uh, quick it uh, led to uh, finding the nerve and finishing the case. Um, they find overall with 200 nerves on either side that the rates of paralysis are similar but using nerve monitoring led to much quicker OR times. Um, without the nerve monitoring to, to with the nerve monitor, monitoring, you went from about 11 minutes to four minutes. I think that's pretty fast, honestly. I don't know what they do in Turkey, but <laughs> to find the nerve that in four minutes is um, very focused. Overall, it also cut down the operative time to about 15 minutes. Again, is that clinically useful or clinically meaningful? Their conclusion was that the shortened surgical time may not seem to have great clinical relevance, but um, the faster the nerve can be identified, the lower um, the surgeon's level of stress. And I can, I can uh, empathize with that um, uh, very much so. And then finally, I thought this was a, a great paper because it looked at those functional consequences of that, you know, are hard to articulate, hard to define uh, that patients complain about. Um, they looked at the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, not just the recurrent, but the superior um, nerve. Um, they found if you define this metric of more than 10% decrease in phonation, um, they found that all of these metrics uh, were uh, much worse if you did not use nerve monitoring. The maximum phonation time, the voice level, the fundamental frequency, and the uh, GRBS voice quality 
Um, all of them uh, were worse if you did not use <clears throat> nerve monitoring. Um, and I think the fact that you could use the nerve monitor to identify that superlaryngeal branch much higher, um, I think uh, shows, I thought this paper was excellent because it really quantified how um, it can reduce the rate of uh, loss of phonation and the quality of your voice. Um, this is important, especially because I think most people understand that the nerve that's most commonly injured during uh, our surgeries is not the recurrent nerve, but the superior one. So this is very helpful in showing that the nerve monitor, although we take it for granted, can be extremely um, helpful in uh, indirect ways. Um, I'll spend another minute discussing um, uh, another head scratcher and a lot of these intraoperative uh, uh, decisions that have to be made. Again, this is taken from um, Dr. Randall's excellent textbook for when we have that traction injury that uh, Dr. Liddy was describing as, you know, it's the number one, two, and three, probably most common reason we have um, injury, not because we're um, boving or causing thermal cautery or the nerve is invaded. It's usually because of when we are um, retracting the, the lobe in order to get that nerve out. Um, whenever um, we have that intended total thyroidectomy, um, I think most of us try to, you know, we, we have that moment of angst uh, uh, and uh, say, should we just go on to the other side? But usually, at least the board's answer is that you probably should not proceed. You should probably close, wake the patient up and come back for the other um, side once the nerve has recovered. Um, I have um, noticed in my practice that there are some times where we go to this red area uh, we're like, well, you know, that quite, doesn't quite make sense. The patient's not going to like it. Um, there is a measured risk of potentially having bilateral cord paralysis, but there are a lot of other extenuating factors where we probably want to go through with it now. And um, this is articulated very nicely by uh, Dr. Randolph and others, where um, the high-risk thyroid cancers, where you have um, a, a patient that needs to move on to uh, radio iodine. Um, I find also when you have as what is described here is irreparable nerve injury. You know the nerve's not coming back. So it's a fool's errand to, st to stop, wake up, and wait for that nerve to come back because it probably isn't ever. Um, and so you might as well just finish the surgery now and let the patient move on for oncologic purposes um, to um, move on to the radio iodine or otherwise. Otherwise, it might just be a very long wait that may never have the, um, the, the outcome that you intended. Um, so I thought this is a very nice way of illustrating that um, although the nerve um, is... Um, uh, to be respected on the other side. There are times where we just want to move on and take care of it. One thing that also um, I have always thought about during um, these surgeries, and I'm curious about whether Dr. Erkin or Dr. Liddy have um, uh, ideas, is whether you spare or sacrifice a nerve that's invaded. Um, I've always found, and in my practice, I've found that whenever we take the nerve, um, there definitely, at least in the short term, is a real drop off in voice quality, uh, pseudo aspiration, gross aspiration, uh, their voice is just so much breathier. Uh, whereas even if the nerve is, signal is lost, uh, if there's still some continuity. I think, you know, my impression is there's some basal tone that uh, persists. It, gi it gives the vocal cord some muscle tone that helps with voice and swallow quality. I think that's very helpful. Um, I think that some factors that we think about, and I, I really um, think there's no um, one priority over another when it comes to this. Every patient is different. That favors nerve preservation is when you have young pa patients with a long life expectancy. Uh, you know they have conventional disease that is iodine uh, avid. Um, on the contrast, elderly patients with a high risk of aspiration. Um, also, you may not want to preserve that nerve just so you don't make their life their lives a lot more difficult. And then, of course, if the other nerve is already out, then you really want to be careful with uh, the remaining one. Now, when we sacrifice the nerve, um, usually you think about um, again, hey, is this a really tough, aggressive, bad biology type of uh, cancer. Usually you can tell grossly intraoperatively if it's really stuck down, it's brittle, it's um, uh, plastered all over, and you know that it's not, uh, it's just, it, you just have a bad feeling about it. And recurrent disease, when you know that this is their last shot, um, that the, uh, it's iodine refractory, that the iodine is probably not going to be able to bail you out. If they've had previous external beam radiation, so again, our radiation colleagues will not be able to bail you out, um, then sacrifice of the nerve may uh, be in the patient's best interest. And finally, um, if the other side is normal, if, if there's no M1 disease. Um, this is um, a, a nice schematic from um, Dr. Drale that looked at um, whether or not you want to spare or sacrifice the nerve. In one case, if the nerve was working preoperatively, um, then you have an option to either leave the remnant sculpted or you know, leave some R1 microscopic disease behind or to end up resecting it using um, that risk-benefit prognosis that 
um, I was uh, described just in the last slide. And then if they have pre-op vocal cord paralysis, we um, uh, uh, definitely have a lot of um, stress in those cases. Um, they suggest um, doing the other side first to really preserve the nerve, put it in the bank, make sure there's no loss of signal before you proceed to the other side. Um, and then uh, depending on what you end up finding, normal decreased or, uh, amplitude or no signal, um, you can sculpt the nerve or resect it. But again, I think a lot of it is not clearly defined. It may be something to uh, study in more depth, but you know, it's not common enough, unfortunately, I think for us to have um, a lot of uh, good data about what the best uh, situation uh, or, or approach is for, for management. Um, I wanted to spend one second and talk about how we, especially for recurrences, um, uh, don't have a good grasp of these subtypes of thyroid cancer. Um, and some subtypes we think of to be very aggressive, but other ones um, are not so bad. Um, we've investigated this in terms of disease-specific survival and have found when you um, break down the numbers and you adjust for a lot of confounders, some subtypes such as diffuse sclerosing really aren't that bad compared to well-differentiated or classic thyroid cancer. Whereas other ones such as poorly differentiated insular and of course anaplastic, um, you know those are bad players, bad actors. Uh, and have a much higher independent mortality risk. In those cases, um, that will really help decide intraoperatively what you might or might not do. I might be more willing to go wide and sacrifice nerves for these very aggressive subtypes, um, but I really don't get so as excited with something like a view sclerosis or even a minor tall cell. I mean, there's so many tall cell variants these days that are called by our pathologists um, that are, you know, would probably have been called classic papillary five years or 10 years ago. Uh, when you ask pathologists, they'll just say, uh, well, there's just a greater um, awareness of uh, these subtypes, a greater awareness of the classification system. And so not all tall cells are created equal. Uh, so for, very, for many tall cells, I'll, I'll elect to save or sculpt the nerve, uh, knowing that uh, the prognosis is not so terrible. Um, we, we really have to kind of sometimes put aside our head and neck cancer training and, and because thyroid uh, cancer care and management is so different um, depending on what you come across. Uh, uh, finally, I'll spend two seconds looking at um, how malpractice, which is in the back of many people's minds, um, has come to the fore. Um, the main issues, if you look at these tables, um, when it comes across, across in court, is whether or not the nerve monitor was used. Um, uh, and secondarily, the adequacy of post-operative monitoring, whether a patient was sent home too soon. And finally, the adequacy of consent. Patients will not remember uh, when they're told about the risk to the nerve, the risk to the uh, parathyroids. I think, um, although if you look at it in detail, the number of uh, plaintiff verdicts where um, they found in favor of the patient, um, you know, of course, for bilateral nerve injury, um, it's kind of like a never event almost. Uh, usually the plaintiff wins in those cases, uh, whereas for unilateral nerve palsy with or without nerve, identification. Um, the defense usually, if it gets that far, um, stands a fairly good chance of um, being victorious. The other ones, um, if you ask me, it comes down to what I kind of find anecdotally. If your relationship with the patient um, is excellent, if you spend the time talking to them, uh, if you don't come across as uh, blunt or, you know, the prototypical surgeon-like, um, the severity of the complication matters less uh, and the likelihood of malpractice is, um, is, is much lower. So in summary, um, to finish up, uh, the anatomy can be unpredictably diverse. Um, classification of its branching system it can help avert nerve injury and voice dysfunction. Uh, intermittent and continuous nerve monitoring is complementary. Uh, intraoperative nerve findings, it's a fascinating area that I think every patient and every surgeon um, has to think about depending on uh, what they come across. Uh, thank you for your time and um, I'll bring it, I'll show it, or give it back to Dr. Erkin for um, for comments. Great. Um, thank you so much, Whitney and Alan, for a wonderful discussion. Um, really comprehensive. I have a couple of questions and I want to get to a few from the audience here. Um, uh, just, to, just in terms of design here, Whitney, you, there's a large number of centers, large number of surgeons involved in um, uh, accruing this, uh, the data for this paper that you, or this study that you presented. Were, were there specific requirements with respect to surgery volume um, that uh, were required for data entry? There weren't, Dr. Erkin. And, you know, I think we self-selected a little bit because most of the people um, who were contributing um, found out about the study through the Neural Monitoring Study Group. 
Um, and so our, our primarily thyroid and parathyroid surgeons, um, where the bulk of what they do is parathyroid and thyroid surgery. Um, but we didn't have a specific requirement. And when you look at those thousand nerves and the patients that were submitted, there were some um, submitting sites where only one or two um, nerves have been included. Part of that is that this is an ongoing database. Um, and so that's why we're working on the next paper. So some of them were just cut off because we stopped kind of right time-wise at that thousand nerve mark. Got it. So, so let me ask you a real tricky question. Um, I have to, uh, Alan alluded to the work that Catherine Sinclair um, has done in continuous intraoperative nerve monitoring. And I have to um, uh, tip my hat to her. I'm a direct recipient of some of the innovative work that she has done at Mount Sinai here. And I um, have to wonder if you are doing intermittent versus continuous, how confident are you that you can pinpoint what the mechanism of injury is? When you're doing um, continuous and you're getting an immediate change in conduction velocity or an um, drop in signal, you know that you've just done something in the last um, few moments. How, how confident are you when you're doing intermittent, intermittent or monitoring that you really understand what the mechanism of injury was? I think that that is a great question. You know, a lot of what goes into this database, you know, is somewhat subjective, but I would say that a lot of our, most of our injuries were the focal injuries, right? Where you can map out with the nerve stimulator exactly where you lose that signal. And often that's at the ligament of Berry region um, or kind of right where there's a dense adhesion that you're pulling on the nerve uh, attached to the capsule. And so you have some idea if you haven't been cauterizing that area, there's no ligature, right? Um, mechanical injury, um, you have an idea that's traction. And most of the time these injuries end up being traction. Um, a lot of papers have looked at, all right, well, traction injuries, it's the whole nerve being stretched. It should be one of these more global injuries where you can't really figure out where the injury is. But places like the ligament berry, right, where there's that just dense adhesion, you could see how that kind of fulcrum of traction can create that pinpoint injury. And that's what we can see with using the stimulator. I think that's where that little stimulator wand can be so helpful. Um, and one of the things that, that I love in teaching residents is being able to map that nerve out so precisely. Great point here. Um, so let me just clarify. Uh, it seems to me that um, the difference between a type one versus a type two really is that the point of injury is at the nerve entry point to the larynx because that's, so isn't that really just a modified type one um, that you've got that as your point of entry, as your point of, of injury? That's a good point. And that's the theory from, from a lot of people. The other theory is, is maybe, you know, for example, if you've extensively dissected the nerve, have you somehow devascularized somewhere along the nerve and, and contributed to nerve injury? But a lot of times people um, do make that assumption that the the point of injury may be intralaryngeal or right at that entry point. All right. So let me let me back up to 10,000 feet here and really ask uh, Whitney and Alan this critical question. Um, what do we take away from this uh, really exhaustive uh, data collection analysis in terms of how surgeons should conduct thyroid surgery in order to reduce the incidence of nerve injury and how does this change kind of the dialogue with the patient in terms of um, affecting or impacting on their expectations? Um, so maybe if you could just comment on that and Alan, uh, just in the, in the waning moments that we have left to us here. Why don't you go ahead first, Wendy? Yeah, just a couple of things. I think that um, major points, you know, traction injuries we know, right, are the most common. We know that happens at the ligament of barrier or at dense adhesions. And I think what, what Alan had brought up about how much do you pull on that goiter? Um, when do you check the nerve to make sure that it's still functioning adequately as you're dissecting is important. And this kind of shows, you know, our, we know that if, if 
nerves are densely adherent to the thyroid or, or, or entrapped in the ligament of Barry, that's where you're gonna have the most difficulty. So really using your nerve monitoring or thinking about that actively as you're retracting where those points of highest risk are, are helpful. Uh, and then I think it's important to remember that, that laryngeal nerve injury is not black and white, right? It's not, I have hoarseness, I have a paralysis. There's a big spectrum um, that confers morbidity to patients. That partial laryngeal dysfunction, sensory um, dysfunction versus motor dysfunction. A lot of these things can cause under-recognized morbidity for patients where there are active interventions if you get them hooked up with speech therapists or, or laryngologists soon after surgery, you can really impact how patients do and those patient complaints, right, that, that doctors I don't think always recognize. I, I agree. Um, I think from the big picture view, um, the paper really, really describes very much so the sort of existential struggle that surgeons have uh, when they see uh, the different variations of the nerve. Uh, and this can be translated to patients in a way that I think that can be easy to describe to them, um, where, um, you know, there are going to be changes um, uh, with that may be very small, but maybe noticeable only to you or maybe drastic. And all of those things um, uh, may come into play and to not just not to minimize that when you talk to the patient about what the potential consequences could be. Terrific. Hey, listen, I want to thank you uh, both for outstanding, outstanding presentations this morning. I think we could go on for quite some time and I apologize to the audience for not getting to a all of their questions were up against the nine o'clock hour here or actually a little bit beyond. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us and invite you for next week. Um, we are running one of our um, regular uh, tumor board presentations with Mike Tuttle as the um, uh, master of ceremonies. Um, and uh, this will be um, coming out of uh, the group in Edmonton with Dr. Janice Pasika being the um, uh, kind of running uh, the show from her institution with several of her, uh, the members of her faculty uh, presenting some really fascinating uh, cases and that I think you'll find extremely interesting. So Whitney and Alan, thank you very much. Thanks everybody and everybody stay safe out there. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you.